Good morning, and, and thanks, Jim, for giving my talk. Uh, I, I guess I'm done now. Um, so yeah, my name is Dirk Hondel. I have been doing open source for apparently way too long. I had a conversation this morning at breakfast, and I had to tell this very lovely young lady that I've been doing Linux for six years longer than she's been on this planet. And that's, you never want to have to say this to a teenager, because it makes you feel really, really old. And then, of course, Jim makes it all better when I told him, oh, I'll turn 46 in a couple of weeks. And he said, oh, wow, I never thought that you're that young. Oh, is that something what you, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so I have, I have, Greg, can we switch to my slides? Greg, I have this 247 slide deck from my marketing people that I would like to go through. Greg? <laughs> uh. Okay, so we'll skip that. I'll do it without slides. That's fine. Um, as, as Jim has said, Intel has been around open source for quite a while. We have invested very heavily in, in building up a strong team of experts, of leaders in open source, not just in Linux, but truly up and down the stack and in all areas where open source is actively being used today, and in many areas where we think it will be going in the future. And we have done so because to us, open source is, is one of the best ways to further innovation. So the, the topic of my talk today is new frontiers, or the new frontiers. I, I guess I'm running out of good ideas for topics. Um, but what I really want to talk about is innovation and how innovation is critical to what we do, we at Intel, but also to what we do as an industry. And, and I'll give a few examples where I think that innovation has been very successful and where we have shown that you can do amazing things with open source. Now, I'll, I'll ask a quick question to the audience. How many of you are CEOs, marketing managers, head of sales, finance department? One? One. I did bring the wrong speech. Uh, how many of you are engineers? Oh, Lena's raised his hand. OK. Uh, <laughs> you are ahead of marketing, I thought. You are our spokes penguin. Uh, okay. So all of us, the engineers in the room, obviously think Linux is cool and open source is awesome. and and, and I assume most of you use Linux on the desktop and, and Linux for everything, your coffee maker, you know, your home alarm system. And I, I, I was at Samsung a, a, a couple of months ago, and they showed me their, their fridge, which is also running Linux. And I'm like, I don't want my fridge to know exactly what I eat and what I might need next. That's just it's a little too much. Um, but the fact is that outside of, of the hacker community, the engineer community, even today, you very often get asked, so what is that Linux thing? So I was on a dive boat, per chance, a couple of days ago. And we talked to other divers. And, and uh, so what are you doing here? Oh, I'm on a business trip on a dive boat. Well, well I'm on my way to a business trip. And we said, we're going to a Linux conference. And everyone's like, what's that? So outside of this community, a lot of people really don't, don't see the impact that we're having. And, and a big part of this is because Linux, per se, usually is invisible. You tell people if you're on Google, Amazon, eBay, you know, any of the large websites, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, you're using Linux. OK, that connects with them. But things that people are aware of are much more likely the client software that they interact with. Now, um, I've been around Linux for a while, and I am famously the person who announced 1998 that 99 would be the year of the Linux desktop. <laughs> okay. Predictions are hard, especially about the future. Um, but actually, if, if you... If I slightly rephrase my prediction I, and I change it from next year will be the year of the Linux desktop into 
a decade and a half from now, Linux will be the predominant client platform, then I was pretty good. So if you look at client computing today, by and large, that is Linux. Yes, I have the person with the iPad taking a movie of me here, which is really awesome. I love that. <laughs> uh, but Android actually is the number one platform for phones, and it's catching up on tablets. And I'm not sure when it's going to cross over, if it already has crossed over the numbers, tend to change rapidly with product releases. But certainly Linux on, on the primary client device for a lot of people is, is right there. And then you look at things like Google's Chromebooks. Chromebooks today are roughly a quarter of the low-cost PC sales. One-fifth of all US schools have deployed Chromebooks to their students, to their teachers, as the primary client PC platform. So the year of the Linux desktop is actually in the past. We have reached the point where a lot of people use this as their primary platform. And they may not be aware of using Linux. I find it very interesting that the, one of the big Linux distributions very, very carefully tries to avoid using the word Linux. And as a thank you for that, I will avoid using their name. Um, <laughs> And, and Chromebooks don't really advertise that they are Linux. They are Chrome OS. And Android doesn't have a penguin. It's, you know, the little Android. Um, whatever that thing is, that green thing. Is it a? It's a bot? OK, a bot droid. OK, it's here, being, being schooled by my audience. Um, but what is, what is really interesting is that it is not so much the low end. It is not so much the, oh, it's cheaper part where, where Linux is successful, but it's the part where you see interesting innovations. So the Android phones literally are the very top of the line. They are amazing phones. They go all the way down to really cheap, crappy ones. But the, among the best phones that you can get in the markets are Android phones. Same goes for tablets. If you look at the, the Nexus 10, that is an amazing tablet. Or the, the uh, Galaxy 3 tab from, from Samsung. Those are beautiful tablets. If you look at the uh, Chromebook Pixel with the amazing 2560 by 1700 pixel touch screen that is too gorgeous for words. Um, so we see really interesting hardware design for Linux devices. We see really interesting software design. We see really strong products that people use because they're easy to use, because they're good. The fact that they tend to be more affordable than the proprietary products is a plus. Now, we've, at Intel, we've worked very closely with Google over the last few years, both on Android and on, on Chrome OS. And you may have seen a couple of weeks ago, or actually last week, at IDF, um, Google announced new Chromebooks. So you get um, more than nine hours of battery life. You get an ultra-thin, sleek design. They're light. They're fast. And they still have the Pixel, of course, which I still absolutely love. And, and we've worked with Google specifically on the things that are relevant to the user experience. So open source graphics drivers that perform extremely well in the application that Google rolls out on their devices. Uh, working on OpenGL acceleration, working on games, working on media uh, encoding, decoding, transcoding, working on audio, working on all the pieces that together give you a good user experience. And of course, behind the scenes, that's boring stuff like power and performance, because those are critical to your battery life. But it's a very close cooperation with Google that help, has helped us create what I think are truly convincing killer devices. And if you look into the future of, of where Google is taking the idea of Chromebooks, and you see how they try to reach a broader and broader audience with a Linux-based client system, to me, that's, that's very much one of those frontiers where I think we as the Linux, as the open source community, 
are having a lot of success and we're showing a lot of the impact that we're having. Another one of the frontiers that I've been very interested in and very much uh, trying to push inside Intel for quite a while is this idea of open hardware. One of the problems in, in, in this industry has always been that once you get to a certain uh, performance of the boards, you are always tied to some proprietary technologies. So that even the higher end embedded boards today, you have binary blobs, you have binary pieces, you have things that you need an NDA for. You cannot really build open hardware. Um, a few months ago, we released the Minnow board, which is an, an x86 board that was specifically designed as the first open hardware board based on x86 and that allows you to build derivatives without an NDA. So all the pieces to this are open and are available. All the, the blueprints that you need, all the, the source files that you need, you can create your own embedded platforms without Intel, without any of the vendors involved. So the goals were um, performance, flexibility, openness, and standards. Performance, well, it's at x86, so it's doing OK. It has SATA, it has PCIe, it has a gigabit Ethernet, it has all the connections that you expect from a PC, basically. It's very flexible. It has this connector that allows you to build daughter bots that have access to all the signals on the board. And this is all open, all standardized. The, the uh, uh, blueprints are available to do this. So you can create an ecosystem around that. It's a fully open hardware design. So there are no hidden pieces, everything, the firmware, everything is open. And of course, standards. I mentioned SATA, PCIe, I mean, the whole thing. And, and regular PC binaries run on it. The Yocto project now has Minoboard as one of its target platforms. Um, so Yocto is a project we launched a few years ago to help accelerate development in the embedded space. And so in many ways, for me, the Minoboard board is just the, the partner device to go with it, the, the hardware to go with the software. Um, and it allows you to create custom projects with very little starting cost. And that's one of our ideas. And Yocto is about to release their seventh public release in a very steady six months rhythm. So in, in October, we'll release version 1.5. I won't bore you with the feature list. Go to yoctoproject.org, and, and you can find that. So now I've talked about the client. I've talked about embedded platforms. Let's go all the way the other way. Let's talk about servers. Let's talk about the cloud. That's another one of those frontiers that you hear a lot about. And I always joke about the fact that the cloud is such a brilliant new idea IBM should have thought of that when they did the terminals for the mainframes 40 years ago. It all seems very familiar to me. And Jim told me that his dad is here at the conference and is telling everyone that what we are doing, they all did 40 and 50 years ago. And, and I think that's actually a good thing. We're coming back to strong technologies that have worked in the past. Intel has done a lot of work with OpenStack. We are actually a very big OpenStack user in-house. We have a, a sizable, I think is the only word I'm allowed to use, a sizable in-house deployment. And, and this is important. If, if you want to push technology, you need to eat your own dog food. You need to actually see how it's used. You need to, to get your hands dirty with it. We're a sponsor of OpenStack, and we are one of the top 10 contributors. Actually, I think I can do for most open source projects out there, we are one of the top 10 contributors. And of course, I'm sure the bloggers will find some where this is not the case, but that's OK. Um, things that we've done with OpenStack were very much based on our use cases that we had and the things that we ran on and said, oops, we wish you could do that. So one of the first things we contributed was this whole idea of trusted computing pools, the ability to say, I can verify in a way that I have trust in that regardless of where this virtual machine is being deployed in the cloud, I know which software stack is running. I know that a lot of open source people are very hostile towards all of these 
um, security and encryption and uh, um, uh, rights management extensions that people do. And as an open source developer, I certainly feel the same way. But as a corporation, the ability to actually measure and be sure you know which software stack is running on this virtual machine that, say, runs your payroll, that's a pretty good thing. And as an employee, maybe you like that too. And we're taking this a step further. We, we are planning to do work on geotacking of the TCP IP uh, traffic that runs between uh, your control system and the, uh, the machine in the cloud so that you actually have control and verifiability of where physically is this virtual machine running. I hear that there are people who are slightly nervous to have their cloud images run in US data centers. I don't know why. Uh, weird. But then again, the emails that I have about this, I'm sure, have been very private. Um, <laughs> and we're doing uh, a lot of work on key management services. So we don't rely on the NSA to manage our keys for us. We actually are trying to build a secure way to do this in the cloud, completely open source, completely verifiably correct and hopefully safe. Um, another thing that we're working on in open cloud is um, improved hardware awareness. So if your hardware has, say, PCIe accelerators or specific features that you want to use from within your image, the ability to, in a transparent way, access these features and become aware if they are installed on the physical hardware on which your image is running. Again, something that we ran into within your own deployments where we wanted to use um, next generation Intel hardware and features that it exposes. But of course, uh, even Intel can't just take all of our servers and switch to the next generation whenever we come with, with a new hardware platform. So you need to be able to actually detect that from the software. Another thing that we're working on, which I find very fascinating, um, is on the Swift side, so on the storage side, on, on uh, erasure codes and the ability to actually have um, a, a full availability and, and survive separation of your cluster without having to quadruple the amount of storage that you allocate uh, uh, to your storage devices. So the erasure codes will allow you to significantly reduce the amount of physical hardware you need to deploy in order to have your storage out there in a secure manner. So what's the summary of all this? For us, for Intel, open source has always been a way to drive innovation. And open source has been a way where we can do this in, in two very different but very complementary uh, manners. A, because things are open source, we can participate right there. And that's the reason why we're one of the top two kernel contributors and why we are in most open source projects actively engaged with key contributors and with a lot of work that we do every day to make these projects better. So we can directly drive innovation. But regardless how big we are and regardless how smart we are, there will always be a lot more and a lot smarter people outside of Intel, most of you. And open source allows us to enable you to do even more exciting and cool things that, that accelerate innovation, and accelerate use of the platforms that we built. So this is not a charitable uh, uh, effort from our sides. This is very much a commercial effort. We want you guys to design great projects, to design great use cases for hardware. And then hopefully, with all the work that we do, these projects will run best on our hardware and will accelerate sales of our hardware. So this was a lot of talk about what a company is doing, specifically in this space. This talked about uh, a, a lot of the exciting work exciting to me that we've done, but I know that most of you are here to actually listen to the real innovators, so to the kernel hackers who've made all this possible. I have no illusions that you're here for me. So I think I'll stop here and, and hand it back to Jim. Thank you. <laughs>